The Baldwin RF-16 is perhaps one of the most unique, if not the most unique, diesel locomotives developed during the 1950s. Having been given a unique nickname of, and often referred to as, the Shark Nose, because of, well, look at its nose, there's no way you're not going to call it that. Commercial sales of this locomotive were quite underwhelming, at just 160 units being sold, including 51B units, for various different railroads. Its eight-cylinder power plant, while very capable for what it was, with turbocharging being able to reduce 1,625 horsepower, while considered reliable for a Baldwin, still failed to set the world on fire. Its, and I quote, unique air pressure controlled emuing system made this locomotive hard to utilize in the company of other locomotives, thus limiting its purchasing audience. While this locomotive featured a very distinctive nose, it had one other very distinctive feature. It had to do with the story of two very specific A unit locomotives that were once New York Central, moved onto the Manga Gila, and eventually became property of the DNH before being sold on to a few other companies and apparently disappearing and becoming an urban myth before finally being rediscovered. This is their story. The Baldwin Locomotive Works was founded in 1825 by jeweler and whitesmith Matthias W. Baldwin in Eddystone, Pennsylvania. Matthias's background as a whitesmith would help him tremendously in the development of his first stationary steam engines, which quickly won praise for their precision as well as reliability. Some of these steam engines would remain in service for years to come in the Baldwin Locomotive Works shops. In 1831, Matthias was contracted to supply a small locomotive for an exhibition being held in Pennsylvania by the Museum of Philadelphia to pull visitors to the exhibition around it. This locomotive, much like his stationary steam engines, ran so well that it quickly gained notoriety, so much so that a small railroad company called the Camden and Amboy would place an order with Baldwin for a full-size locomotive that was to be used on a short suburban commuter line. The Candon and Anboy had already ordered a model John Bull from an English manufacturer which had been imported to the United States in kit form and had to be assembled. Unfortunately, the company had yet to assemble it just yet. Paying a visit to this locomotive which was being stored in New Jersey in parts, Baldwin quickly took note of the dimensions and mechanics of the machine, of which he would utilize in developing his own full-size steam locomotive, which would eventually be known as Old Ironsides. Baldwin would employ a lot of dead reckoning to get the parts just right, eyeballing measurements, as there were no machine tools at the time that could make measurements exactly to the point. This locomotive, which would feature a top speed of a then hair-raising 28 miles per hour, would remain in service with the railroad for 20 years before being retired. And this is essentially how Baldwin, who at the time were largely a steel and iron works, became a steam locomotive manufacturing company. While sales for the company would initially take off, they would fall down drastically during the Panic of 1837, from a high of 40 locomotive orders per year in 1837 to just 9 in 1840. Baldwin would survive this period by taking on partners and making some very wise financial decisions. The company would also prevail through the Civil War years, as this is an era in which none of the railroads could afford or were able to purchase any locomotives. Again, due to sporadic rail connections, not to mention a lack of a transcontinental railroad, there was no way of literally shipping a locomotive without sending it by sea or via the Mississippi River, making sending a locomotive to a customer very difficult and challenging. And during the Civil War era of the United States, completely impossible. This would of course change as soon as the Civil War came to an end. With the construction and eventual completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, the demand for railway equipment, especially locomotives, went through the roof. And so Baldwin's locomotive production shifted into overdrive, and they became not just a steam locomotive manufacturer in the United States, but the steam locomotive manufacturer in the United States by the early 1900s. Thanks to the quality and performance of their machines, this caused the company to make massive expansions out of its original plant and by several of its smaller competitors. It should be noted that like most manufacturing companies in the United States during this period in time, many of Baldwin's competitors were quite small, quite literally cottage industries that built locomotives to order. Please note that this is an era before the assembly line had been developed by Henry Ford in the early 1900s. While for the time this was practical as the one company could literally serve as its locomotives in its own private territories, the market would change to the point where this simply wouldn't be possible, and Baldwin being one of the major manufacturers at the time, quickly gobbled up these smaller companies and formed them into one massive one. Baldwin made a massive contribution as the United States entered into World War I, with 5,551 locomotives built for the war effort.
the end of World War I would bring a further boom to Baldwin, with many European steam locomotive manufacturers suffering severe damage or being outright destroyed. Those countries, in an effort to help jumpstart their economies, were forced to import locomotives from the United States, and Baldwin received most of the contracts, due to the company's reputation of its locomotive's quality and performance. After the war and the start of the Great Depression, the company unfortunately would begin to decline, and it would never quite recover from this period. During this particular period in time, Baldwin would begin to collaborate with Westinghouse on what would become one of the first diesel locomotives produced in the United States. This is a very important and critical step that could have helped Baldwin sure up its future. Unfortunately, the company dismissed diesel engines as a fad and refused to take them seriously. It could be said at the time, if anyone were to have predicted the fall of the company by the midpoint of the 1900s, despite the decline that Baldwin had suffered during the Depression, they would have been forcibly committed to an insane asylum. The fact of the matter was, however, this is just exactly what was about to happen to the Baldwin Locomotive Works. While Baldwin would again play a key role in the United States war effort during World War II, and profit from it as well, decisions the company would make during this period in time would essentially set up for ruin, mainly the lack of research and development into diesel locomotive production. While much like Baldwin, Alco, for example, would make the same decision that diesel locomotives would not be a major viable manufacturing commodity, they would still invest heavily in diesel locomotive development, something Baldwin would fail to do. This would, unfortunately, put Baldwin in a very vulnerable position once World War II came to a close, as the demand for steam engines all but dried up, but the demand for diesel engines went through the roof. Now, while it is true that Baldwin did produce some diesel locomotives during this particular period in time, their technology was heavily out of date. Baldwin's locomotives quickly developed a very infamous reputation for horrendous lack of reliability and chronic mechanical issues that were long since solved by its competitors. While the RF-16 Sharks were definitely a bright spot in the company's otherwise dark reputation, having again being introduced in 1950, their limited run of 160 units was just a drop in the bucket and nowhere near enough to turn the company around. In a desperate act to save the company, Baldwin merged with another locomotive manufacturing company, and of course its fellow rival, the Lima Locomotive Works. Unfortunately, this did nothing to improve the combined company's fortunes. The company would eventually be forced out of business in 1956. With the closure of most of its Eddystone plant, the company would, from that point on until its demise about 20 years later, exist as a heavy equipment manufacturer, with the rights to its mechanics and prime movers for its locomotives being sold off to a foreign company. The sharks that were still in service began to dwindle at this point in time, even though they had gained a reputation for being quite robust and capable haulers. The main issue being is that they were now orphaned and parts were becoming harder to come by, and the idea of going on a parts hunt to keep a locomotive in service, no matter how unusual or beautiful or capable it was, was not appealing to Class 1 railroads at that time. The New York Central Railroad, which was the last original owner that continued to operate its sharks at that time, would eventually trade its last six units into General Electric. Then, later in that year, in 1967, GE would in turn sell these units to the co-hauling railroad Monongahela. The Monongahela Railroad, as it turns out, was not the greatest place to keep these locomotives, to put it mildly. Essentially, this coal-hauling railroad was looking for cheap locomotives to run very hard, and the heritage and rarity of these particular locomotives was not a concern of the company at that time. In fact, by 1972, all but two of the six locomotives the company had acquired from GE had been sold for scrap. The remaining two locomotives had actually also been sold, until someone at the DNH had caught wind of this and decided that they would make a great addition to the company's roster. The Delaware and Hudson, or DNH for short, had been one of the bright spots in an otherwise dim, cloudy, not to mention gloomy, environment that made up that of most of the Northeastern Railroads at the time, mainly because of the incompetence of management from the Penn Central Railroad. Feel free to take a look at my documentary on the Penn Central as it will provide a great amount of background as to what was going on during this period in time in Northeastern Railroading. By this point, the now independent DNH, under the leadership of Carl Sturging, had become known for its roster of unique historic locomotives, as well as a good portion of Alcos, not to mention the Alco PAs. The Alcos were now of particular interest as Alco had gone out of business nearly six years before, with which the company would offer historic excursions around its territory and beyond. This in itself was almost becoming a second business for the DNH as it began to make a respectable return on its investments when it ran these excursion runs. As for acquiring the Sharks, this couldn't have been better for both not only the D&H, but for the scrap company, 
Essentially, all the D&H did was trade $6,000 worth of scrap boxcars to the scrap metal dealer, which would have been far easier to scrap than whole locomotives would be in exchange for these particular locomotives. Hard price to beat even for those days for a pair of functioning locomotives or at least a pair of locomotives that could be made functional. And for this useless scrap metal, the company would gain two more historic locomotives it could operate and use as an asset. They would be numbered 1205 and 1216, respectively. Unfortunately, things just didn't work out for these sharks. To start with, because they were the classic A units, they didn't have any facilities to allow for switching, which meant they could only be used on through freights and, of course, the before-mentioned historical passenger trains slash excursions. The sharks also lacked dynamic brakes, which made them useless on the steep grades of the D&H. In addition, they shared an unfortunate trait of most Baldwin diesel locomotives in that they used pneumatic or air pressure to control the emuing or multiple unit operations, which meant these locomotives could not be connected with other engines on the DNH's roster and could only be emued together and had to be used in a pair. All these issues drastically limited the usability of the sharks to the DNH. Then there was the fact that, as age began to catch up with them, they began to develop more and more mechanical problems, and the company that had taken over the rights to produce replacement parts, which was based in Belgium, as it turns out, couldn't produce parts up to the quality and standard that these locomotives required to run reliably. The final straw came by 1978, with the DNH's financial position turning around 180 degrees, and not for the better. The Conrail juggernaut that had taken over the Penn Central Railroad, as well as its neighboring bankrupt railroads, had begun to right the ship, and while there was very little, if any, profit from the company at this point in time, traffic not only began to move reliably, but also most notably quicker than anything the DNH could manage due to its railroad infrastructure. And doing so, unfortunately, essentially starved the DNH for business. This is despite the fact that the DNH had been granted extensive trackage rights over the newly established Conrail network. With all this, the company's historical rail excursions were now suddenly a luxury in which it could no longer afford to fund, even if these historical excursions were beginning to turn a profit for the company by themselves. And thus the D&H Sharks were suddenly put up for sale and bought by a company called the Castorlite Corporation in April 1978. Castorlite, which was a locomotive leasing firm, would eventually find a home for these locomotives on the Michigan Northern, where they would be leased out to operate on that railroad. Please note the following information comes from a forum post that has been reposted several times on the internet by the Michigan Northern's former Vice President of Operations, Alex Huff. Also note that I have taken some liberties and filled in some blanks in this material to the best of my knowledge to help tell the complete story. The Michigan Northern had been established in 1975 and began operations in 1976 on April Fool's Day no less. The same year, not to mention day, that Conrail actually began operations to operate lines in the lower peninsula of Michigan. A good portion of this was along the former Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad, which had been operated by the Pennsylvania Railroad for quite some years and now Penn Central Railroad. With the Penn Central in bankruptcy and demanding that this railroad be taken off of its hands, this line having not been set aside for Conrail, subsidies were essentially offered to a railroad to operate this line, and thus the formation of the Michigan Northern. The company had begun operations with a few RS3s it acquired successfully on the second-hand market, specifically from the Chicago Northwestern Railroad. These were actually the company's second choice. The Michigan Northern would have preferred a few RS1s that were former Gulf Mobile and Ohio units, but the price the then known as Illinois Central Gulf was demanding for these units was simply too high to justify purchasing them. Although RS1s during this period in time tended to bring a higher price compared to RS3s, and many other Alco-type locomotives, with the exception of 251-equipped units, which were considered to be worth more due to enhanced reliability and power output, mainly due to their higher reliability of their older, but by this point well-proven 539 power plant. The RS-3s were a bargain basement locomotive at this time due to the fact that their 244 power plants were known for being ticking time bombs, thus making these locomotives expendable if not disposable as the 244's crankshaft issues, specifically these crankshafts failing at unpredictable times, due to lubrication being diluted by diesel fuel and other such flaws in their designs, tended to keep the prices of these locomotives down at a rock-bottom rate. And if they were to fail, it would not be worth rebuilding one of these locomotives, as a railroad could acquire a functioning locomotive for less than the parts, let alone the labor it would take to rebuild one of these prime movers and get a locomotive that had suffered this failure back into service. Business steadily increased on the Michigan Northern, requiring it to buy more power, in this case in the form of an RS-2 that was formerly owned by the Green Bay and Western. 
The Chicago Northwestern, who had again supplied the first two RS-3s to the company, had another two RS-3s available, but the Michigan Northern was not quick enough to acquire these. The company also missed the chance to acquire a few RSD-4 and RSD-5 models from the Chicago Northwestern as it was concerned about the six-axle trucks. With its business continuing to increase drastically, the Michigan Northern was now extremely desperate for any kind of motive power it could get its hands on. And to the D&H Sharks and the Casterline Corporation, owned by a gentleman by the name of John Kunze, who offered them for an unbeatable deal of $100 per day lease to the company. Things got off to a pretty rough start. It became very clear that the D&H Sharks, which the D&H had said were in excellent shape, were not. In addition to a lot of wear and tear that apparently was not properly described in the sale of these units to the Casterline Corporation, there were the engine parts which were acquired from a Belgian company that had taken over the rights to produce parts for the Baldwin 8-cylinder power plant, which as it turns out didn't quite fit correctly. Unit 1205, for example, would suffer a head failure early on in its career with the Michigan Northern, with the head liner literally walking itself out with the heavy vibrations of the engine, as again the head failed to seal correctly to hold it in place. The Michigan Northern's master mechanic, Wade Plummer, ended up bolting down the liners to the block itself, disabling one cylinder in the process to keep it in place until the proper solution could be found. Losing the one cylinder apparently did not adversely affect the horsepower output of the eight-cylinder prime mover, and it would run this way for a while until it was negotiated with Mr. Kunze to have the prime mover completely rebuilt, with Mr. Kunze providing the parts and the Michigan Northern providing the labor. Unfortunately, even though 1205 was successfully rebuilt, this was short-lived, as the engine was run down on oil pressure one day, scoring the crankshaft. This left 1216 to be the only operable of the two sharks, and drastically reducing its ability to serve the railroad at the same time, as again, these locomotives could not be MU'd with the Alcos the company had, or any other locomotive other than Baldwin's, as they used pneumatic MUing devices. 1216 would therefore be connected with the two other Alcos that were being used on the Michigan Northern's Mackinac City Freight, which ran to Mackinac City to utilize the Mackinac's car ferry. Due to the fact that, like its sister, 1216 couldn't be emued with anything else but a bold one, it was largely kept shut down until the train would reach a hill, specifically what was known as the ruling grade. At this point, the conductor would go back and start the shark up, the conductor would then operate the locomotive separately from the other two, as again it could not be MU'd, in order to provide extra power to get the train over the hill. On the way back with the unloaded cars, the shark would largely drag the rest of the train along, with the Alcos being shut down, as again it could not be MU'd with those two other engines. 1216 would continue in this manner for quite some time, until unfortunately it would also meet its own unfortunate and bad end, again due to a very idiotic human error. During snow clearance duties, apparently that following winter, the shark had been clearing snow off the Michigan Northern's main line using a Jordan spreader. The crew operating the engine needed to turn it around on a Y and foolishly backed it up into thick snow. This grounded number four traction motor, rendering the locomotive inoperative. By this point, John Kunzee, the owner of the Castor Light Corporation, decided he had had as much as he could possibly take of the Michigan Northern and decided to have the one locomotive, 1205, Again, the unit that had been rebuilt by the Michigan Northern but run low in oil and thus scored its crankshaft to rebuilt by Diesel Electric Services in St. Paul, Minnesota. Unfortunately, the luck for this locomotive again ran out, as during the time Diesel Electric Services had the locomotive and was physically repairing it, the company went bust, thus leaving the locomotive improperly repaired and apparently a complete and total mechanical mess. To no avail in failing this particular attempt, 1205 was sent to join her sister, 1216, in storage on the Escanaba and Lake Superior Railroad. Eventually, after the two sharks had sat for a long time on the Escanaba and Lake Superior property, Mr. Kunze agreed to sell these locomotives to the Escanaba and Lake Superior to at least in part cover their storage fees on the railroad for the time they had been there. The official transaction for the sale of the sharks took place sometime in 1979. The Escanaba and Lake Superior Railroad finally seemed to be the perfect place to send these locomotives, as the owner of that railroad, John Larkin, has always been a dedicated Baldwin enthusiast, running Baldwin locomotives till many, many years after they were out of production, long after pretty much every other railroad had given up on running these engines in daily service. Mr. Larkin promptly ordered number 1216 to be put back into service once the traction motor was repaired, and the unit would make a few revenue runs in 1979. Unfortunately, this would only last a few months because not long after this had started, yet again an apparent combination of issues with the Baldwin power plants themselves, 
plus the imprecision of the parts the Belgian-based company had supplied to the DNH when it had previously done work on the prime mover of this locomotive, would all lead to this prime mover suffering a major failure within a few months of being reactivated. After some major prime mover work, the locomotive was put back in service in 1982. Unfortunately, this was only short-lived, as within a few months, 1216 broke its crankshaft, essentially putting it out of service. It would never run again. As for 1205, the locomotive apparently had been evaluated for activation, but it became very clear the prime mover had not been rebuilt of anything resembling a correct standard, and the terrible quality of work that was completed was also incomplete requiring it as well as its sister to undergo complete prime mover rebuilds, which Mr. Larkin had acquired the parts for. But due to staggering costs for this particular project, the project was put on indefinite hold. The status of these locomotives during this period, somewhere in the mid to late 80s, became very much muddled. For the longest time, these two sharks were essentially left outside where the elements took their toll, causing more and more rust to form on the bodies. Unfortunately, these locomotives would then, around this period in time, be put into storage, and not to be seen again for nearly 30 years. The reason for my unusual sarcastic attitude is for the reason why they were put into storage. One night, somewhere in the late 80s, a group of individuals made their way onto the Escanaba and Lake Superior's property, and stole many Baldwin manuals, parts, and unfortunately, and also most notably, the builder's plates off the sharks. Suitably abreaved, John Larkin quickly placed these locomotives behind lock and key in the company's roundhouse. For a while, the status of these locomotives became largely unknown, and at least something resembling an urban myth, as it was revealed within a few years after these locomotives were locked up that the roundhouse now housed the company's new-to-it fleet of first-generation EMD power. John Larkin apparently having finally given up on running Baldwin's as the company's main source of motive power. A flurry of rumors soon circulated on the net at this time, including one that stated these engines had been sold over to the Pacifico Railroad. Then these curious images turned up sometime around 2010-2014, which showed these locomotives stored in a warehouse, which was formerly owned by a company that had been a customer of the Escanaba and Lake Superior Railroad. When this particular company went bust, the Lake Superior and Escanaba purchased the warehouse and began storing the sharks as well as some equipment inside it. Again, John Larkin is a big Baldwin slash railroad equipment collector. The locomotives looking largely as they did in the late 80s, early 90s when they were last out in the public to view. It was then revealed in 2020 in a Trains Magazine article that where Trains Magazine had interviewed Mr. Larkin that the locomotives were destined to go to a museum upon his death, which one it's not clear. Then in 2021, something shocking happened. Unit number 1216, incidentally the last Baldwin shark to operate, was pulled from the storage facility and moved to another facility on the main line of the Escanaba and Lake Superior Railroad. That's apparently having been done to free up room to work on other equipment at this particular facility in which the shark at once occupied. Since then, nothing has been heard as of the making of this film as to the current status of these locomotives, other than in fact they will be donated upon the owner's death to a museum. Now, I must address the rail fans that have gotten quite aggressive in demanding that Mr. Larkin donate these engines beforehand or do something else with them. We have to remember the fact of the matter is, A, they are in his possession, can do with them what he pleases. They are not the community's possession, they are in fact privately owned. And last but not least, B, we have to remember how these units were treated the last time they were on display. Now, admittedly, it's not clear whether these were rail fans that broke into the facility or just a bunch of hoodlums, etc. Whatever the case, his property was disrespected and Mr. Larkin is understandably annoyed. I can't say I blame him for not wanting people to look at these locomotives, can you? Think of it this way. Let's say these locomotives were the equivalent of a classic car you owned, a very rare classic car with hard-to-find parts, and you walked out one morning to find, after you had left it outside for the night for whatever reason, that the hood ornament was missing, something you could never get replaced or remade. Would you be willing to leave it outside? Would you be comfortable with people looking at it? Anyway, I can't necessarily blame Mr. Larkin for what he did. It's at least good to know that this equipment will be protected from the elements, unlike a lot of historical equipment, which even in museums to this day is left outside and is thus subject to the weather and or at the mercy of the weather. And that's going to do it for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If not, thumbs down. Please like and subscribe. And as always, keep the metal side down.